Great, good morning. Welcome to the RISC-5 Summit 2021, in person. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for attending. Uh, my name's Kevin McDermott, and I'm with Empiris, and I'm gonna be talking about the five steps of RISC-5 verification based on our technology for a simulation-based reference model. So I'm with Empiris, and this is our, our presentation. So just talk about RISC-5 for a minute. Obviously, this whole event is based on RISC-5, which is allowing a lot of design freedoms to customize and optimize a processor that's unique for your SOC application. So there's a lot of talk about the design freedom at the top end, all these things you can do with RISC-V. You can tune it, optimize it, to take all the standard extensions, or add custom instructions. So there's a lot of freedoms to innovate around the RISC-V uh, architecture. What that means now is for every SOC developer, you're now effectively your own custom processor responsibility. This takes on an extra challenge of verification. So you have the design freedom, all the features you add and design will naturally flow through to the verification side. Now currently, if you do an SOC project, you take an IP core from one of the big well-known vendors and you test your SOC, you test everything that's around the processor. You don't test the core. With RISC-V, this is now a new change. So really, this is the whole freedom of choice. Not everybody needs to test everything. If you are doing a, maybe a prototype or a proof of concept projects, it may be sufficient to do a lower grade of testing. Obviously, if you're going to high volume production, you want to make sure you take the most rigorous testing that's available. Now, currently, the process of verification market is not an event of itself. There's not a lot of EDA tools that have been invested around this because there are a few established teams that develop their technology and they keep that in-house. That is part of the value of their brand. RISC-V is different because now every SSC developer would like to develop a custom processor, great on the design side, great on the features. They need now to look at how you're gonna handle the verification. We can, we can help. So today, I'm just gonna talk through five approaches that you could consider for your project that might be appropriate for the features that you add and the program that you need to achieve for your quality. Um, the first one is more of a marketing expression. Anybody that develops a processor, this could be a grad school uh, project, the first thing you want to do from a software world is to say, hello world. That is a great achievement. You've taken the written spec of the ISA, you've implemented RTL, it functionally runs something, the program that you intended it to run produces a result that you like. So getting any software to run is a great first step. If I was talking to my mother, she would say, that sounds like a jolly good job. Nobody would ever tape out a chip based on that level of verification. Hello world is not DV. Um, another expression might be that um, if you can boot Linux, perhaps you've completed your task. And I can see you, you're laughing there, yeah. It, yes, it, um, it is a nice achievement. It's a check mark along the process, but you're not done. So, um, yeah, so number one basically is uh, not really there yet. Oh, that, that was actually an important point. I don't want to scare everybody. You know, if you're doing a proof of concept design, if you're looking at an FPGA, maybe a university project, that might be fine if you're going to look at other aspects of your chip and your system. So that that's, could be fine. I just wouldn't want to fly in an airplane tested to that level. Um, so seriously, let's get into some more uh, test structures. Um, as you know, with the RISC-V uh, compliance architecture validation suites, they produce a set of tests that you can run that have an embedded signature. So that is a good uh, sense because whenever you have a test, you want to know what is the expected result. So to run the test and see the result, that's a good, a good situation. So what you could do now is take your new RTL run those tests and the, I'm sorry, I'm banging, run your test and the comparison, or sorry, the inbuilt verification, the signature says that you did a good job. Um, that's fine, unless it doesn't. In the case where it doesn't work, 
you might want to look at a more of a comparison approach where you'd run the same tests in a model environment and see if you can then try and debug why things didn't run the way that they were expected. Now, to help support this, we've put a reference model up on GitHub. Uh, you can download that for free. You can work with the uh, architectural validation test suites, and you can get a sense of the coverage, and you can get a sense of that sort of early stage step. So this is the, the first entry to a professional DV flow. It's not a full DV flow, but you're, you're sort of getting yourself uh, familiar. So that's good for um, uh, some level of testing. It's not complete. It's maybe a basic. It gets, you, um, it gets you started. So let's go to the first more serious approach. Um, so this is now based on an instruction stream generator. Um, in this case, we're showing an example from Google. So a constrained random generator would look at the uh, instruction formats, would look at the various use cases that could be expected within the software, and would generate a random set of uh, instruction sequences. So a truly random instruction sequence would produce a lot of false negatives, a lot of invalid sequences. You know, you, you, certain operations can never follow logically. So a constrained random means that they are logically correct, they can happen, they're legal within the ISA, but they're an extreme corner case of whatever software may be written on your device. So an instruction stream generator is a key starting point. From that, you would then compile that code and run that on the RTL, and also run that on a, a reference model. So then you've got two log files that come out. So the natural step then is let's compare the log files. Easy to say on a simple core, perhaps. On a more complex core, you might run into some discrepancies. So that's a, a, a nice sort of uh, verification starting point. Um, oh, too much there. I'm, I'm jumping ahead. Spoiler, spoiler. Oh, don't look. Right. Ah, there we are, right, right. Okay, yeah. stay. So the, the drawback with that sort of method is that you end up with these very large log files that can be time consuming. You're gonna run a large amount of simulation time. Um, if you're doing a whole regression run or you're running something over the weekend, you don't want it to fail in the first hour or the first few minutes. You want it to run to completion. Equally, if an error was detected, everything after that event might may to prove to be invalid. So you could end up wasting a lot of resource time. The log files can, themselves can be very large. And then the whole comparison, depending on the event space and the complexity of the processor, that could be more complex to compare the log files than actually the work on the verification of the processor. So it's a good method for some class of cores. So let's talk about a data path uh, lockstep compare. Now we're involved with the Open Hardware Group. This is a consortium that adopted the pulp cores out of the ETH Zurich. So good, well-known, popular open source cores. And the open hardware approach is to take these open source cores, but deliver them with industrial strength verification. So open source has a great price, but the value is in the quality. If these cores can be tested to the, the best standard that we know that's available, then that really helps adoption. And the beauty of open source, of course, as I said, is the price, but also people that are looking to modify the core or add extensions or further enhance uh, the processor. If that's the target market, one of the things we need to do on the verification side is to make sure that the test bench is equally extendable so you set up a test bench, and that's great to verify the core as in situ, but then any adopter would also want to run the same tests again, compare them. Maybe if they modify the core, they'd also want to enhance the test bench to keep, uh, keep use of all those resources. This test bench is also used for regressions. So this is now run continuously for the cores that are available. So it's a great way to compare the state of the processes, to look at them in lockstep, um, the moment an event uh, is discovered, it allows you to help with the debug. It makes it very efficient that an event triggered will, will show you that there is a problem immediately. And then it's in the same system Verilog environment. So any debug analysis, you can look at the RTL view of the simulation and the processor and look at the same worlds to try and understand why that discrepancy occurred. So this is sort of state of the art 
lockstep data path uh, comparison. And this is where we worked with uh, open hardware work. It has a drawback. It doesn't cover asynchronous events. Now, a processor, as we know, is going to run some complicated code, and it's going to run in the real world. It will have interrupts. There will be things and dynamic things that will affect the processor operation. So this is the next step. Let's go to level five. Let's look at asynchronous lockstep. So what we did by working with the open hardware group, we looked at how to integrate more closely the RTL and integrate that into the test bench to work with the reference model. And by using the trace and looking at the events within the pipeline, we're able to tightly couple these and look at the event triggers around interrupts and asynchronous events. So you can now really test the full operation of the full dynamic core. That is a great solution. But it has a slight drawback. RTL, when you design a processor, you expect it to work with a bus. You expect it to work with caches. There's a number of interfaces that you expect the processor to work with. There is not a standard way to hook up to a test bench for verification. So every processor would have to invest the time and effort to hook your RTL up into the test bench. So working with the open hardware group, what they realized, we had a great solution for the first core. That was a great milestone achievement. We've got a high quality core that's available. You can go and download that. And then immediately within, within a few months, there was a dozen cores that was suddenly appeared on the roadmap. Multi-heart, doing it out, out of order, looking at um, uh, vectors, uh, the latest uh, hypervisors. These are gr I mean, the, the story for RISC V is rich in features. The DV side is thinking, I can see what the team are thinking about over there, and I can see this train of work that's coming towards me. If every processor has to be hand-tuned and hand-connected with dedicated trace pins, how do I get the reuse of my infrastructure? How do I get, how do I get this all to work together? So that's the problem statement, which um, I can now do a marketing pitch. Ta -da! On Monday, Empiris announced Empiris DV. This is now an encapsulated test bench solution with a new standard called RVVI that builds on the work we did with uh, open hardware to interface into any processor. So that's the marketing slide. And now we've got the engineering slide. If you look at these test benches in, in situ, what you have is the RTL you want to test, and you have the reference model you want to compare against. As I said, the instruction stream and the flow, we want to run both with the same instructions. We want to be able to compare them. So there's two critical interfaces, from the processor RTL to the test bench, and from the test bench to the model. Those are the two, two interface points. So we've developed this standard called RVVI, RISC-V Verification Interface. Catchy, isn't it? It's a public spec, it's a public document, and we put it on GitHub. This is under the working group within open hardware, and we think this is going to be the game changer for RISC-V verification. If we can publicize this standard and get everybody, as you develop your design features, as you develop your new processor core, think about every single feature, how do I test it? Easy to remember? You design it, you've got to come up with a way to test it. We think this is the method as you develop your RTL, as you do every line of code, as you do every program, every feature, think about how am I going to fit that into the RVVI format, the APIs and the traces to make sure my engineers can verify it at the end. So there's two, two real key pieces, parts to this. On the RTL processor side, it's how that interfaces into RVVI how you get all the hooks and signals out of your processor so you can do the comparison. On our side, we've got the reference model, so we've got all the hooks and features that go into RVVI, but there's also the extensions. You can have any of the standard RISC-V extensions, you can have any of the RISC-V ratified extensions, and then all of these extensions actually have different subversions and options. So over time, different draft specs have been developed, we support those, all of the specs have different features and configurations, so all of those are documented and included. You just need to know, on the verification side, which features did the design team think they chose. So, for completeness, 
a verification team might want to check did they really put in the features that they said they put in in the data sheet. So there's an interesting comparison there. Also for custom instructions, if you build a custom instruction or add custom registers on the RTL side, you also need to add those into the reference model. So that's really the role of this RVVI, is to make sure there's a complete synchronization. So a reference model. It sounds easy if you say it quickly, but actually RISC V is a huge specification. There are many, many options, many, many configuration choices. Every implementation can, for very good, accurate reasons, make certain choices. Now, it's not a complete free-for-all because we have to be remain to the standard. The whole thing about the ecosystem is every RISC-V design should, in theory, be able to run any software given the right parameters of the right feature set. So you have to stay within the bounds of the ISA specification, but there is a lot of freedom. There is a lot of options you need to cover. So again, with a bit of rigor, on the design side, you've got the white sheet, white space, you can choose any option you want. Document and feature every single choice, which spec you think you used and how you used it. And then on the DV side, that's a, that's a checklist. So we have a process, a checklist to list all the features that you could consider and have used and what your opinion is and what you've included. So we've got a full envelope model that, call, that covers all the ratify specifications, some of the draft specifications, some of the earlier revisions, uh, full vectors, uh, the DSP SIMDs, uh, the floating point, I mean, RISC V has many, many standard extensions. And then one of the freedoms of RISC V is you can add your own custom extension, your own custom instructions. So on the design side, on the RTL, you profile your application, you profile what you need in your processor, and you come up with your killer mousetrap, secret source, special instruction. That is a great freedom for RISC V. You can also model that on our side on the reference model. Now, whenever you change something, you always want to be wary if you're going to contaminate the underlying model. So we've got a very high quality model that's been used by many, many companies, many, many design flows. If you're going to extend that model and add these custom instructions, we do it as an exception library on the side. So you don't affect the quality and the inherent architecture of the standard model. The, we've got a standard interface to include, include the custom instructions without including any uh, burden on to further test what you've changed. Yes. Right, we get to the summary. We're, we're doing well. So risk 5 is all about design freedom. risk 5 is the generation, the next 50 years of architecture. This is a great time to be involved in processor design. One takeaway message I'll have any design freedom, any choice you want to make, think about how to test it. In a nutshell, that's our story. Um, we've got development flows, we've got the tools, we've got the interfaces, we've got a whole setup here. We've announced this product in Pyrus DV, which gives you the reference model encapsulated in UVM system benches, uh, system Verilog, which gives you the full verification access. And it's widely used. We have listed a few of our, our customers and partners that are using this in situ right now. And uh, we've got some demos set up over at our booth. So that's me, my name's Kevin McDermott. And that was a brief overview of the five levels of risk five verification. Thank you very much. Thank you.